A long time ago in one of our Patreon Q&As, we got a question that was something along the lines of like, how do you make your ma life more magical? And all three of us were like, do more magic, <laughs> you know? And yeah. I started to think about um, the Glengarry Glenn Ross film, like where does that whole uh, speech on, you know, how to do the ABCs of being a businessman, like ABC <laughs> always be closing. And I desperately need a shirt that says like always be conjuring <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> or always be casting or one of those memes that like the wizard going to like fish at a riverbank and he's just like I told my wife I'd go casting it didn't say which kind <laughs> one of the best one of the best yeah well that's kind of what this episode's about right is what mm. happens when you're doing your ABCs and you're running into problems yeah definitely if you're casting and uh, your line gets tangled, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I think no better person to discuss this with than you, because out of the three of us, you're the only one that's now, uh, as of very recently, like a couple days ago, are offering Ritual for Hire services. You've been doing it for many <laughs> years at this point, kind of like by word of mouth, much as I did for a long time. Like I was not never mm -hmm. on the website and never quite online, but certainly I was doing a spell work slash rituals for hire in, in person. Word of mouth in my city. Like I, I've been around to many businesses and helped enchant some things and get some stuff off the ground. But suffice to say, it's not something I do anymore. I'm too busy with my other job and with other things to, to do that. But like now that you're launching finally the ability for people who have been profiting off of your magic for a very long time and you're now able to expand your services to other people including making custom talismans and doing the usual coaching and mediumship and helping people with how it is to actually see their spirits how it is to actually train themselves to be a better medium to be able to get to the point where they're able to have a pretty consistent spirit communication and, and how to recognize those things with a very customized approach i think it's great that you're also willing to do all sorts of things now for you know, money for love, for protection, for cleansing, exorcism. I think it's great to just talk to you a little bit about how to actually deal with things when they don't work out because people don't like to talk about it necessarily. You know, it's not always yeah, fun to admit what happens when things don't work, but I think that's what hopefully uh, this is something that we can actually just discuss for everyone's benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love every facet of the work, even when things are uh, not quite working out as I plan them to. So uh it's good to see the other side of it out in the open from time to time. I actually just spoke to a client recently where I was discussing with them that the only difference between where they are right now and where someone they admire whose abilities and erudition and uh, mastery of a particular tradition is, you know, the difference between them is not just time. It's also that this person has failed more times than my client has tried, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an exhilarating thing to recognize is that all it takes is, is messing up more uh, because that's how you learn, right? And if you lack that humility, if you lack that ability to reflect on, not to make it sound like this is just pure like trial and error, but it is through these processes that we learn how to be more in touch with our spirits and kind of get a feel for how they literally make change occur in the world so that we can also know how to do that. Because one of the main questions I ask my spirits all the time is like, if I were to ask you to do this, how would you do it? Teach it to mm -hmm. me so that I have an idea of how, how are you manipulating things? Who are you contracting? Who are you subcontracting? How are you personally exerting influence and how can I do the same? Yeah, definitely. It's like, extensions of these exercises where we just gain further insight into our spirits and um kind of their lives as sentient agents mm -hmm. always benefiting our own magic not just because like you know explicitly asking them hey how do you do this but it brings you closer in line with like what they're doing and allows them to flow more into your life and allows you to flow more into theirs you know when you're in right alignment with your spirits then everything tends to work out, so. 100%. Well, awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Let's get right into it.
Be not alarmed at a frightful house which you may hear. It's finger, salt, yep. and break it. You buy it, key. <laughs> <laughs> we had so many ones for this one. I like blockbuster key. Mm-hmm. In the spirit of, you know, dealing with troubleshooting sorcery and what happens when a ritual doesn't work out the way you intend it to. Yeah, definitely. We also had uh, barnowl.key, the new Instagram, shameless self-plug. Oh my god, <laughs> I know, I literally made a post being like, look look who is finally summoned by the Tetra Instagrammaton. <laughs> finally <laughs> conjured after all that bragging about not having social media you're like i'm only on discord but you can't know what my discord is like okay now here we are <laughs> yeah right well thank you i mean i'm glad you got on because people can actually contact you more easily uh for your services and you're already doing great for your current clients but also um <laughs> really really good that i can finally spam you with all the memes instead of screenshotting them like a delinquent for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know yeah. I- I'm just mourning the fact he he's been caught by Zuckerberg's incantation ball. No, literally, like <laughs> just there's a little like weightlifting owl just like spinning in a in a circle now, being trained down <laughs> into the depths of the of the meta algorithm bowl. Legit, he trapped me in his uh, Hawaiian bunker construction. No <laughs> the, uh, foundation sacrifice. <laughs> I was literally stop. I was just gonna be like, I bet he sacrificed like various animals to the foundation. What was the one that you said that's done? Was it in the Netherlands, like a cat uh, to the fireplace? The cat is more of like a German, um, ah, okay. Swiss, and Austrian thing, as I'm aware of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a cat will sometimes be sacrificed to one of the walls of the house ah, okay. during construction. With the idea that it keeps the winds, which in these areas are the bearers of disease at bay, because the cat will fight the spirits that are impregnated into the air that will actually foster illnesses, especially of the lungs. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I've also seen like cats mm-hmm. being done to literally scratch away enemies, right? Same yeah, thing yeah, with yeah. Like, dogs to like warn of a certain threshold. We have, a, in some parts, this is not a generalization, but in some parts of Serbia, for example, a horse, especially the skull, will be given to a beehive where the mm-hmm. apiary is to protect the bees from the ill winds that can like destroy an entire hive, especially because horses are so associated, not just with St. George, you know, and Yadilo and so on, but also with um, various other wind beings, right, that deal with that fertility. But certainly you get like the toad, the threshold and so on. Anyway, I don't think Zuck is doing this. <laughs> but if he needs someone to do it for him, he can hit your girl up because I will take a hefty fee uh, to perform the ritual in his Hawaiian bunker. <laughs> his <laughs> famous name <laughs> set up. <laughs> Just call down the apocalypse for him after the fact. Yeah, uh, call me Zucky. We can make it. We can make it work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll help you. No, you know what? No, I'll help you with the, the, the threshold. But you can hire Key to help you actually make the metaverse work. <laughs> <laughs> and not be like a colossal failure of an investment. Yeah, right. Give me the infinite Facebook funds and I will uh, twist politicians to your uh, your every whim. <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy doing it. <laughs> yeah, right. As if, as if we aren't on record of being like anti, anti-state, anti anti can't see everything. <laughs> Anti-corporatists. <laughs> and you say, we're uh, like, little... <laughs> 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 oh man, oh, man. <laughs> yeah it was blockbuster key barnell dot key for the instagram bust it down at animal style key <laughs> break down the smaller parts key yeah it's, it's all good this is what happens is people ask us like random like political magic questions in the q a's for patreon and then it's just key and i like popping the fuck off with our like anti-cop like <laughs> juju and our protest juju and all this other stuff like very mask off about uh the ways in which we funnel our magic into our progressive protests but suffice to say uh very excited to be talking to you all about tailoring magic to be even more effective uh, mm-hmm. As usual, you can follow us on twitter.com forward slash Frightful Howls. The Patreon is patreon.com forward slash The Frightful Howls. You get a bonus episode every month curated by you, the listeners. You get to send us some questions and we answer them, make a whole episode based on your interests. Uh, you get Salt's amazing monthly almanac. This month he released a great one that's all about uh, the vernal equinox as well as the eclipse coming up. We get our monthly live occult book club. Last time we did Emma Wilby's Cunning Folk and Familiar Spirits and it was a lot of fun. 
Uh, mm-hmm. You get show notes for every episode and plenty more. And please do uh, give us a rating and review on Spotify and iTunes. It really does help us fight the zook, <laughs> the <laughs> Debbie urge of the algorithm. Let's just get our work out there. And it means a lot. And uh, yeah, check out our services. You can get donations from all of us to different capacities at withcunningcommand.com. Uh, and definitely get a good astral reading from uh, Salt. Get an interesting <laughs> bean divination reading from me uh, using all kinds of techniques that I've learned over the years of studying Balkan Favomancy. And uh, get be key in your corner. <laughs> mm-hmm. Talismans, uh, coaching, sorcery for hire, mediumship readings, all the good stuff. I do love how you specified, by the way, that like I'm reading what you wrote on with Command Command. And you're saying, you know, you business, fast cash, financial sorcery, sexual interest, blockbusting, red opening, inspiration. And then you say, for erotic workings, I'm going to be hired to draw any sexuality and gender preference. So I specialize in procuring the attentional love of men, of clients <laughs> of all genders. And I was like, yeah, I know. I've hung out with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to um, bring the, the Wallace AOE into people's lives. Oh, my God. Wallace from uh, Scott Pilgrim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, you're the <laughs> was the, the, amount, the amount of questions we got that was just like, wait, excuse me? <laughs> what was that one that we got that was just like, he, the most frightful hell of all time, was finding out that you're gay? Are you ma- as mask IRL as, as your voice? And you, you only answered with a yes and then like moved on. <laughs> 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 all right, well, we'll take it away. What are we, what are we chatting about first? Yeah, so today I wanted to start with taking a look at the actual points of failure that are intrinsic to like a magical working. Mm -hmm. So if something goes wrong, we should start by analyzing the points at which things can actually go wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 totally. Um, And right away to my mind, there are kind of like six main things. There is a lot that can go wrong, but it's kind of easy to break down once you get into the detail. So the first thing that I want to talk about was like kind of the use of materia itself, which is saying like when you are actually putting together a sorcerer's composition, what's being used and how well is it working toward the effect? So let's say you have like a really annoying person in your life and you need to sweeten with you. Of course, the very classic go-to technique is going to be get a jar full of something sweet, put an effigy of the person in there, go from there. But knowing what to use as the agent could actually flavor the work in one direction or another. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So knowing when to use, for example, white sugar versus brown sugar versus corn syrup versus honey versus molasses, what herbs to put in it, et cetera. It's kind of not such a question of technical competence. It's more of figuring out with your spirits what direction you actually need to go down for the specific thing that you want, not the general. Furthermore, there's the idea of, did you select off a list of correspondence, not realizing that two or more of the herbs that you put into the composition might be counteracting each other, might be going to battle against each other as spirits, might need other things to remediate and harmonize their effect in a given blend. That's such a good point. And that comes a lot with herbal traditions, right? Where this is understanding mm-hmm. that some herbs are intrinsically opposed against each other. So like, even if you're going through some kind of like correspondence list, and I don't just mean like Elster Crowley 777. I mean, even a concept of like sympathy, right? Like planetary sympathies, that there's also ideas of antipathy. Like, you know, you don't want to be wearing old clothes around Venus, whereas mm-hmm. with Saturn, you probably do want to be wearing old clothes. Like... That kind of notion is, um, I think, even beyond herbalism, like it's just kind of everywhere, right? Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some spirits that can absolutely feel a little bit miffed if you show up to them not in your finest. And then others that if you come dressed to the nines, they're going to think that's kind of pathetic. <laughs> Especially if like they're very ascetic in their tastes and preferences. So I think that is absolutely something that I would focus on as well in terms of just understanding that one, what is your herbal theory if you're working with herbs? In my traditions that I've trained in, there's a world of difference between collecting something like picking an herb, for example, in the morning versus the noon, the afternoon, and the evening. 
and especially mm-hmm. at night. And so depending on the position of the sun in the sky, and you don't know necessarily what that is if you're buying dried herbs. And I'm not here to like say, don't use dried herbs. We all use them, right? I think uh, at the same time, it is good to know where your things are coming from. When I wild harvest myself, I always note what time it was that I got it. I mean, mm-hmm. even, even for me, um, whether or not the herb is harvested in a cemetery has a whole different authority now and different spirits inherently linked to it versus if it was done literally anywhere else not even going into like do i have a relationship with the river where i collected a tag stone and so on and so forth i i think that an ideal to strive towards is knowing that like if you can identify the basic herbs and allies that are around you like mm-hmm. and know them by sight there's a lot of good apps that can help you like beyond taking an herbalist or foraging course lots of good books about like like search the name of your city or the name of the province or state you live in or general area and then like look for like herbalism or just knowing that kind of thing right you know i think that um that's absolutely something really good that can help you out right another thing to know is apps like picture this there's like one i think that's i don't have an iphone but i know the iphone has its own like plant identification uh, software inherent to the program there's mm-hmm. lots of things like that that can absolutely get you going right in terms of being able to not just identify where you can be moving towards with your rituals but also knowing uh how exactly you can understand your role in what you're doing and the role of the spirits inherent to it because it's not just about like offending random spirits it's knowing how they ally with each other so when some of my spirits like are really, really fond of honey specifically, and they prefer it over everything else. And others get a little heated by honey because it is a kind of warmth. And so it's a sweetening warmth, but it's a warmth nonetheless. And so I have to remember this will get them in a particular state, same as with using different kinds of syrups and so on. So, or like pomegranate molasses, for example, very favored by some of my spirits, not so favored by others. And there's also the question of not just what plants you're using being allied to each other and herbs or materia interacting with your spirits in a particular way. But there's also which herbs or materia as spirit itself are you in right relationship with? Which do you have pacts with? Which do you have developed understandings with as a spirit one-to-one? Because it's like, if you are, you know, a really old school conjure doctor, who can do every piece of magic with five herbs because you have packs with those five to do everything for you, then it's like that will always supersede even recipe from a given tradition. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. Something that I think our approach for the three of us is always spirit first. So even if you have a formulary or some kind of recipe that you're following or a structure, if one of your spirits says change those, let's do this instead, and you know that spirit to be authentic and reliable and someone who is almost always you know, telling you the truth in the sense that like unless they have to hide something from you for their own agendas you have a, a bond with them that is reliable i would always veto whatever you're doing in favor of the spirit because they're the one that's carrying out the task and i think that's one of those things that's good to do right we talked about this in the divination episode but like when you begin with a ritual like or when you even begin at the planning phase which is really when it begins right it's like talk mm-hmm. to your spirits and be like who stands up and who volunteers to do this for me and then depending on that spirit's preferences you'll already know what kind of material they have like or plant spirits they have allyships with or like what kind of rituals they prefer and like out of the three of us i think it's fair to say that like key and i have a approach that definitely tends towards these kinds of constructions that involve this kind of materia like compositions but like even for salt like this is a man that i have seen my own two eyes cure burns scrapes cuts like heal them visibly fully in front of me including to myself uh, like i was cooking with your mom mm-hmm. with salt and like we were making like a christmas roast and we were taking things out of the oven and like my forearm bumped against the inside of the oven and it got burned and you just immediately use an oral charm and it like physically healed in front of my eyes right and this is one of those things where like that's not material i mean you do make some good ointments but like this is something that you just did and it was because of the power that you are you're able to call on your spirits through oral charms in very particular ways i love a good bialitsa like i'm very trained in buying you um super creation for charming orally and this is something that you know i've seen you do extremely well right it was one of those things where they were kind of like okay listen because i don't want to learn them <laughs> I, I was like you know I, I like these long big ceremonialized procedures i think when we met you were really into like very long litanies especially yeah yeah exactly and that was that was something i like okay you gotta get over that like you're talking about power okay 
if you don't got the power to do it in one word, then do you really have the power? I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> you're all. Well, I guess. Uh, I guess Call I'll give it, it a shot. And holy shit, I really like this new method. This is. You know, I get to be a lazy piece of shit sometimes and I can still fucking boo. I mean, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not. <laughs> There's no laziness involved there. Like it's a whole skill set in and of itself. But and I like the way you phrased it, you know, that it's like, can you still do it with one word? Can you do it all with one herb, right? Like if you have a very strong relationship with mugwort, for example, could mugwort be your road opener? Could it be your sweetener? Could it be your herb of domination? Like, yes, there are other things that inherently are a bit more talented in that respect, but can you draw upon it through your relationship? I mean, it's even it's even like that in respect to spirits, right? Like in their spiritual office, like when we come to the grimoires and so on, like when you conjure this demon, he has a very set office, a very set number of things that he controls, that he has rulership over. But if you develop that relationship, you might find leverage that's going to get him to do things that are outside of his immediate purview. You might, depending on your relationship with the spirit, be able to command them or befriend them into being more able to deal with these kind of subjects like that aren't necessarily natural rulerships but i think master key is going to be speaking about that shortly so i don't want to talk too much on that right now <laughs> when you changed this discord name once to young master lunar owl <laughs> that was a personal favorite <laughs> should change it back to that <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to no, laugh keep... when some random Discord user with the actual username Young Master Lunar Owl gets an influx of DMs after this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> nah, you should keep it. You should just keep rotating the B every now and then. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I I think that's a great point, Saul. I really appreciate you bringing that up. And I, I, the way that your spirits kind of humbled you about that just goes to show that this is something that um, has immensely benefited your practice. Is to because I, I get it. Some of us just are maximalists in terms of like we just like to kind of keep um, adding. But one of the problems with that is like what happens when those things now are in conflict, or what happens when they're excess. And I think that you learning how to charm, including charming directly from spirits, like they give you the oral charm. You don't necessarily just learn it from somebody. Knowing that spirits are holders of lineage and they are holders of transmissions of power. And sometimes you are the first, like for lack of a better term, human or incarnated person who inherits that. That's how traditions begin, right? Well, I mean, some of them, and actually this is this only interesting ones in my experience. The most powerful ones are ones that wasn't told prior don't even remember immediately after like they just completely leave your memory you just speak them once that's the only time you ever say it and things happen immediately but you'll never remember it again you'll never remember it again you don't you didn't have it in your head prior the spirit just came at the exact moment whispered it in your ear you said it you passed it on you know were those even your words when you spoke them that's another question that's worth asking right but mm -hmm. in my experience like those have always been the most potent which obviously you know i think when it comes to oral charms there's like a lot of different traditional logics like do you say it three times do you say it seven times do you say it depending on a different charm like but i think in some respects i might even go against like some traditional logic where you know the more it's passed down the stronger it is versus you know things that are learned straight from the spirits the, the strongest like there's a whole kind of i can just say from my experience like the shit where it's been kind of fire and forget has had the most surprising results, but I think also it's been invaluable. I, I think if you're stuck in that kind of like ritualized mindset, being forced to deal with like a method that's so simple is just like a medicine, man. It will change the way you do everything afterwards. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. It goes back to the point of, you know, when you are in lockstep with your spirits when they're able to flow into you and you're able to flow into them then regardless of how it comes out it's gonna work out yeah 100 because you're not like pushing right you're not like forcing a change you're you're kind of like literally in the flow yeah i mean it's them taking a driver's seat right and that's kind of probably 70 percent, 75 percent of workings that's where you want them to be like you know maybe you want to make sure they're still going to follow the speed limit <laughs> <laughs> there's kind of a bit of playback there but yeah for sure i think making sure that you're in step with them making sure that you know you're keeping track you're walking in the same road like it's it's crucial 
Mm -hmm. And then speaking of, uh, you know, walking in the same road of spirits um, to go to another, you know, possible point of failure in spell work is um, how good are your links to the target? Do you have a, a road to the thing that you want to get to? Let's say, you know, you want to do like a boss fix. Do you have, you know, your boss's hair in a bag that you can be doing stuff to? Or is it far more nebulous to that? You know, what happens when you only have a name? What happens when you don't even have a name? You have like a company. You have a more nebulous or more tenuous link to something. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Finding ways with your spirits to navigate around that. Very famously, there's a technique that I think was recorded in... What are the folders from Cat Ironwood at Lucky Mojo? Mm -hmm. Where you can take cassia bark and burn it to ash along with papers that just describe nebulously the targets over and over and over again. And eventually that ash will grab and uh, agglutinate enough of a link to the target that it can actually be worked upon. And, you know, just kind of troubleshooting and finding ways with your spirits. You know, do you have a spirit in your corner who can actually go out and retrieve links for you. Um, yes, I love that point so much. I, I remember reading from, it was definitely from Cat Ironwood's workings on Cassia chips and bark being used, not just for like controlling and domination spells, but to literally replace uh, lacking a link. Like hair Yes, exactly. Else. Yeah. And that's something that absolutely like, some of my spirits are really good at doing. Like they're like hunting hounds that go out and like sniff these kinds of things out, right? Metaphorically speaking, like they will go and mm -hmm. retrieve a link and put it into a piece of paper that is now substituting the hair. And you don't want to overuse that for sure, because putting it too much, like at that point, like the spirit that you're having do this can start asking for a pretty significant like offering. And I don't just mm -hmm. mean like in terms of significant in terms of like money you would spend on it i mean like you would have to go out and like really do something for them like i know one of my spirits if i started to go like to that link they would want like a rooster not just for them but another rooster to feed the thing that i'm now replacing mm -hmm. but like another thing you can do absolutely uh with regards to links to targets is like open roads to get them right you know get to f be able to like get somebody that you're like doing this kind of stuff to reveal an important aspect of themselves like their birth chart you know what i mean their birth time this is why mm -hmm. you don't tell anyone your birth time right <laughs> or same thing with like it's it, that's one of those things with like an astrologer they've taken a vow and never to use it against you you know that's one of the things that i remember assault you have in your charts like like little like i have a pact with this intelligence for your privacy because it's okay if you know obviously you trust me if you're buying it from me but like i don't want you just to trust me i want you to also trust like that my connection with my spirits on the line like i will be abiding by this right but same thing for like measuring someone's you know body right like making sure you have like their measurement from wingspan as well as like top of their head to their toes that kind of thing like these kinds of things you know, the, the three-digit number on the back of their credit card, you know, their, their mother's maiden name, their CAPTCHA, <laughs> all these kinds of things. Anything you can do to narrow it down. And certainly, I think with, when you're not just enchanting a person, but like a place, a business, knowing who in the hierarchy is important. Because if you need, like, I don't know, your phone fixed, and you have a phone with, let's say, like Apple, you don't have to like contact the CEO of Apple to get it fixed. It's actually, that will not be helpful to you. You want to contact the person that can actively deal with like your insurance or deal with your warranty or like be able to actually like go and repair it for you, that kind of thing. So that's where you want to open roads to, right? Like we definitely had situations that we talked about like on, on this podcast, right? Of like what happens when you're looking for health magic and what you, your spirits do is they open a road to and a specialist that will actually treat your condition with empathy and with a much lower cost, uh, as mm -hmm. opposed to just miraculously healing it yourself. Both options are possible, but sometimes like they know the one that will be more helpful to you in the moment. Definitely, yeah. I still love that story of, you know, the best healing spell sometimes is uh, your doctor takes you seriously now. <laughs> Yeah, which unfortunately is a huge problem, right? Mm -hmm, Especially for definitely. women, for example, with getting like doctors to understand their pain and take them seriously. Mm -hmm. So I think that absolutely like knowing what your links are and knowing what your spirit needs, because sometimes like I've talked to a spirit and I'm like, what do you need from me to help you target this particular situation? And there have been times when they've said honestly not much because of the existing inroads you have into this person's life. And sometimes they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like I have a vague description. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, it's kind of like, you know, giving a description of someone to somebody and they're trying to draw like a sketch artist. Like sometimes the spirit is kind of like, I have a vague idea of what you're talking about, 
but like get me dirt from a road that leaves your city into their city it's so, like if they're like an ocean away from you just in, in like that direction you know like print off all the information you have on them and burn it down to ashes if it's like a company you know <laughs> lift the tile <laughs> from the top yeah. from like the <laughs> place where it has no security cameras and uh shave it down and like burn things on it and so on so for capture the house plant you know plant things in the planters like where the actual sexia oh my god what is that in english Flower pots? There we go. Yeah, plant pots. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like these kinds of things, right? Uh, my, my, my brain is cycling through six languages, sorry. Um, <laughs> like being able to like put things in there or like specking the sugar in the office room <laughs> so everyone talks sweetly of you. Like there's many things you can do and there's many ways to be discreet because people are doing magic aggressively in countries where it's illegal and punishable like, you know, by the mm -hmm. law. So, like, that's not it's just like, going to discourage people from doing magic. It's just going to make them craftier and, like, sneakier. So there are ways to do things. Like, I've often echoed something that I've also discussed with uh, my godfather, Jesse Hathaway Diaz, about in terms of, like, links between curanderismo and, like, Balkan folk magic, in which sometimes, like, the oil that is, like, the powerful oil that your mentor uses does not look like anything other than ordinary olive oil because it's been strained so much that it is indistinguishable and it's just next to all your cooking supplies. Because, you know, when the old woman is like jujuing her husband to be loyal to her, you know, she's just cooking with it. Like it's not, you can't, you're not supposed to taste the difference. So it has to be like a very, very, very well strained or same, or, you know, for us, like the oil of St. Marina of Antioch is the oil in the lamp that has been burning in front of her icon for generations at this point. And you just keep refilling it, right? Definitely, yeah. So don't think that you have to go like ham, you know, and like get like absolutely everything, like get this person in every way. But you know, like you can give someone a cup of coffee during a meeting, like buy them one, and then they can take the cup and they're like, I'll put this in the garbage free and rip off the lip where like the spit went, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like, there's all kinds of things you can do. Uh God, we sound so creepy. <laughs> How you gotta do it sometimes. All right, which which is gonna be witches. <laughs> yeah, cool. Everyone wants to be a witch until it's time to do witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you will eat the frog and you will like it <laughs> oh my god dude like episode one okay feeding the eucharist to the toad call me toad <laughs> the way i'm consuming the body of christ <laughs> oh man i think another way of looking at it as well is just like the ease right like if you're trying to cajole spirits into doing something it's always good to make things a little bit easier for them just to you know make them a bit more willing to do it in the first place. If you go to a uh, private investigator to, you know, let's say there's been a case of insurance fraud, for example, you're not going to run up to them and say, here, here's the company name. That's all the information I have. Like they're going to want to know the company's email addresses, the membership, like, you know, senior staff in the company, potential people involved in the insurance fraud claim. Like there's a whole list of kind of things that, and every little bit of information kind of contributes to building that picture, that kind of baseline idea. And it's the same thing with like links, I think, especially it's like there are more inroads, there are more paths, there are more options, there's more resources for the spirit to kind of use to engage with the target, whatever that might be, whether that might be your own wealth, right? Like whether that's a particular petition, whether that's an individual in question, you just want as much as you can get in pretty much all of these cases. I, I love the way you describe it as options because it's so true right is having more options so the spirit doesn't have to struggle frankly you know to get to there and that's why you ally them with other spirits that maybe are intentionally hunters of distant sense and can pick things up like waving a petition that includes just someone's name and like what you know of them in front of like this particular spirit through the incense they catch the scent and run off and get it for you and of course, there's always the option of, you know, if you're good enough at spirit flying, you can always go get the link yourself. Mm -hmm. Bring it back and distribute it among your spirits. The New Orleans incident. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that makes me um, back. <laughs> so speaking of the options for your spirits, you know, no matter how many options that you give them, especially if you're doing, you know, sorcery against another sorcerer, one of the next problems and why a spell might not be working out is encountering resistance, encountering countermeasures deliberately designed to impede whatever it is you may be doing, you know, wards, protections, uh, the spirits of another person, um, 
their ancestors, their patrons, uh, warriors in their court that are pacted to defend them. There's also the resistance of condition. You know, what's the astrology at the time? What's the actual weather outside? What's the moon phase? What's the planetary day and hour? And then there's the consideration of proximity. Like, are you an ocean away from the person? Or are you temporally distant from the person? Like, will it take, you know, dozens of hours just to get something to them? And, you know, these are all different subcategories that can, of course, be overcome with different methodologies. You know, if, if in case you encounter a ward, you know, learning how to kind of magically lockpick them. To use Lockpicking kind of key. <laughs> Add it again. Lockpick lawyer throwing his hat. Mm-hmm. Was that it? Was a hat, right? That was being thrown against the door by the Toadman yeah. that it would unlock? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I need to learn that. So, <laughs> <laughs> also, in the case of, you know, someone's spirits, let's say they're very strongly protected by their ancestors, but you were trying to fuck them up because they've done something pretty ridiculous to you or someone you care about, naming their crimes to their own spirits, naming yeah, yeah. their broken promises or broken oaths. You know, this is especially why having a relationship with some sort of uh, saint or being or deity of justice or of law can often be useful because they can back you up and be like, yeah, this person broke oaths. This person broke promises. This person acted in this unruly way that caused a lot of harm that can, you know, turn their spirits off in their uh, aggression or uh, vigor of defending uh, actions that may even be anathema to the spirits themselves. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that's one of those things that is, is pretty essential when it comes to dealing with resistance, right? Because distance mm-hmm. is one that you've laid out, right? Like what happens when you're not just like geographically distant from the person or target, but you're also like emotionally distant from them. There's a reason mm-hmm. why witchcraft accusations and anxieties are extremely, for lack of a better term, like vulnerable and present in families right it's it's your mother-in-law it's your sister it's your brother it's your son you know that mm-hmm. gets accused of this kind of thing it's also why i think for millions of reasons beyond this but i think that's why the best person to be jujuing a politician is that person's wife or ex-wife or daughter <laughs> or or estranged you know uncle or whatever like that's someone who has like a closest to them that they can exploit mm-hmm. right because otherwise you're just as distant from them as anybody else who's praying for their soul in a church is right but I do think that's obviously like if they're like a mayoral candidate in your city, that's much easier, right? You can mm-hmm. go to their campaign, you can go to their lawn and bury like a bunch of lead talismans, you know, like actual like lead cursing tablets in their front yard. <laughs> and certainly you can do all kinds of things like that, or you go to their campaign offices and put war water everywhere. Like there's also things you can do. But I would say that it depends on the distance, right? And I love the example you gave of spirits because that's something people underestimate, I think, at least in my experience. It's like, well, what happens when someone reads your receipts out to your patrons? And mm-hmm. it's like, here's when this person lied, which offends you for these reasons. Here's when this person stole content or plagiarized, you know, in these ways, which is what I which goes against the patronage of these spirits to invest in their creativity and so on, right? Now, not every spirit's gonna be swayed by that. Some of them are kind of like and you know, yeah, just, they're yeah. like, okay, whatever. Like, that's not I'm being fed. Like, it's just it's I'm 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 hired. Like, I don't really care. But some of them will, right? And so absolutely, and just as you might not necessarily have to petition a deity for of wealth to get you, or like the spirit of wealth to get you money when you already have like a 12 plus year relationship with a spirit more typically associated with love. Mm-hmm. Because, like, well, just make them love you, make your customers love you, make the make your brand like uh, you know have the same kind of loyalty and affection as purchasing you know your mom's new uh business venture that kind of thing like investing in family that kind of thing um there's a reason why you want to go to the spirit that you already have a really good relationship with so in that case you know someone's ancestors may be very like no i don't care i'm praying for them but sometimes they may be like hmm i know of like oral charms in my mother tongue that's literally about like getting someone's ancestors to like step back as a curse is being mm-hmm. delivered so that they don't end up in its war path and be like let your descendant bear this because they deserve it for these reasons because they've like assaulted or hurt this person otherwise if you step in you're going to take the blame for the assault for the crime and this also 
gives good ideas of like what to do in terms of setting up your own defenses you know mm. knowing these techniques it's like how do you how do you gird your spirits against someone reading your dirty laundry to them mm -hmm. yeah 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 and there's also you know just to go back for a second to the point of like you don't have to go to a money spirit for money you can go to a love deity that you already have a relationship with for a really long time you know you can do kind of anything with anything if you're cunning about it mm -hmm. um, Instead of the like, plant, right? yeah exactly like there's um there's an exercise that i sometimes give to my um you know coaching clients of picking a random planetary day and hour a random spell type and be like okay how would you do it so it's mm -hmm. like okay it's the day of mercury hour of jupiter you need to do a love spell on this person for a client how would you set it up using those conditions you know it's like okay well giving these people strongly dignified speech whenever they're talking to them you know blessing their tongue by saying you know speak truthfully and eloquently at this time have like the gift of oration be able to like kind of schmooze the person you know mm -hmm. and just kind of going along those those um lines of being like okay how would i do that in the face of this resistance what is what is a clever solution mm -hmm. and just always being on the lookout for like the one loophole as a um a methodology to get through things one of the other points that i want to talk about is just strictly timing you know when you did this working of whatever it may be and you tell your spirits i need it done in a week and it doesn't come to pass in a week what happens when you know you are going to your spirits being like hey what gives and they're like dude i told you it'll take two mm -hmm. you know it's like if something can't elapse in a particular time frame asking is this negotiable like for more offerings could it happen faster or it's like will it need to take the amount of time it takes because maybe it needs to undergo you know a new moon to a full moon or a full moon to a new moon mm. or needs to elapse through a particular lunar mansion for example it's just kind of all these questions that you know can be involved in the dialogue with the given spirits at a time and that is one that is definitely remedied through divination mm -hmm. and i think gets to the point of over divining on a given question, which I know you want to talk about, Senga. Yeah, I mean, I think we've discussed overdefining in our episode on a divination primer. And I think it's always worth reiterating that, <laughs> like, you can never know everything. Like, there mm -hmm. will always be things that are included to you. That's just the nature of life and every interaction, right? Like, you don't, you'll never know absolutely every single thought that goes through your significant other's head and heart, right? But you can choose to trust them based on their behavior. And so, one of the things with over divining in, in general is I would say that one of the like significant like factors that can come up and play is when exactly do you know to stop, right? So, like, I like to divine before I do a working, to see like, what is the general, like, what do I need? What does the spirit want? How do I make this actionable, right? And the first thing that I do with this is like, one, one question might be like, well, how do you personally go from divination to a working? Um, mm -hmm. I like to ask my spirits, like, who here volunteers for this? And once I have a good idea what that is, I move towards the next question, which is, what do you need for it? Like, do you need more links? Do you need more things? Like, I check with, like, yes and no's and these kinds of things. I don't have to confirm absolutely everything, but I do like to confirm at the very end to be like, do you agree to do this for the price that we've set, the terms that we've made out, and for these resources? And so if it's a bean chart and they say, yes, it's favorable, and they are essentially agreeing that it will work, I bundle them up and keep those beans in, like, a cloth bag on their shrine and remind them, like, by the way, this is your reminder that you said you would do this. <laughs> So, uh, and that's kind of like a seal, essentially, of our agreement. And so one of the things that I do to turn the divination to action level steps is yes, yes, no's. Um, if you're doing like a broader kind of chart, you know, you can see like, what does this part of this chart mean? What does this part of like, you know, for, whether it's geomancy, whether it's tarot or playing cards, letterman, the beans, 
Salt, I'm sure you can speak to how to do this with astrology. But in general, like I'm looking at specific factors like resistance areas, places of weakness, like and like potential problems. Like this will already be highlighted in the chart for me, right? In terms of like, oh, there'll be issues with the target spirits. There'll be issues with getting uh, this per my client's application to shine more than other people. So we need to go about it this way. A heavy handed approach would not be well. You know, I ask for these kinds of things. Like would um. It seems like this combination of elements in the chart is suggesting that actually like a heavy handed approach would not do well because the person that we're charming who is going to be deciding on whether or not my client gets their application uh, approved or not is actually more psychically sensitive than they let on and not consciously so, but they'll get a vibe if they're getting massaged to, in a particular direction mm -hmm. and they won't like it. They'll feel their ego will resist it and they'll be like, no, well, you know what? Now I'm now I'm just not going to choose this person because I feel like a weird impulse to do so. I don't like not being in control. So what you do is you make them feel like it's their choice, right? You make them feel like, though they're really in control. And what you want is this person because that would reflect well on you because of their work and so on. And you would get benefit from it. And so mm -hmm. what kind of uh, material does the spirit want or need? Maybe it's nothing. Maybe they're like, no, just a candle, some incense, and I'm good. I can just do it myself. And sometimes they're like, you know what? Give me this and plant it here. Let's make a packet here and we'll deliver it to them. We'll plant it somewhere in their office or we'll like, we'll mail them a card like a playing card kind of thing <laughs> with juju all over it uh, for their office, that kind of thing. Like, you know, who knows what they might suggest. Sometimes it's very silly stuff that you don't even predict would happen, but that's what the spirit wants. And then have some kind of an idea of when you should see results. Sometimes I like, I want to mm -hmm. see movement within three weeks. And sometimes they're like, just give me some time and you'll see what happens. And then we'll make the, we'll make, we'll adjust accordingly when that first omen tips off. Right. Like when it comes to like drawing a lover, right. Like you might have a petition that includes how you want them to look and how you want them, uh, what kind of hobbies you want them to share with you. What are non-negotiable traits? What are negotiable traits, you know, in terms of like, should they live close to you? Are you okay with long distance? Like what kind of careers or what kind of money should they be making that kind of thing? How could they fit your lifestyle? If you have certain things that are kind of like, you know, we're not necessarily stuff that other people are, always going to be comfortable with in terms of your own kind of life. Maybe you're someone who travels a lot and that could make someone feel lonely. Maybe you're someone who is in between jobs a lot, that kind of thing, you know, just to make sure that that person's lifestyle fits yours and that they're like, I always like to include the clause when I, when I, when I used to do client work for people and I was like taking on like bring me an ideal lover clients, you know, which I'm sure is something that you also have a lot of experience in key. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the things that I like to include as a clause is like they find your quirks endearing, but they're not annoyed mm -hmm. by it. They're not weirded out by it. Like, they just like that you're weird like that. And that makes them think it's cute and wonderful. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. One of the most important auto-includes in any uh, lover drawing petition. <laughs> really yeah, so basically, yeah, yeah. So there's just a lot of things like that. And, you know, see what the spirit thinks. Since you never know if the spirit's going to accomplish it themselves, like, fully, or if they're going to hire a bunch <laughs> of other spirits to help them, or if they're going to pray to a bunch of other spirits to assist them and lend them power in this. So the offering should reflect the fact that they're going to pay off a bunch of different people. But also you can do, I like to do 50% up front and 50% when the work is done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you were mentioning the other day, wafting the, the offering under the nose of the statue of the spirit. Like, oh my god yeah great well we were talking about that with our friend mahegan who was on our episode mm -hmm. on french canadian folklore uh just the other week uh when we were all hanging out in person but specifically it was um uh, there was a patreon question for our bonus episode for the q a and one of the things we're talking about for, like fast cash i was saying like so that was a big a pound cake and i just put it in front of expedite's shrine and i waft it like i, I make them <laughs> myself i don't buy the cerulee it's like i bake them and i'm mm -hmm. like oh doesn't this smell great and then i eat it in front of him and I'm like, this could be you. <laughs> this could be you if you did it, like mm -hmm. tomorrow. And then he does. And I'm like, bam, I made you another one. Like, <laughs> I'm like, don't, don't worry, homie. We're all eating together. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. It, it's like the classic like, Orthodox and Catholic folk magic thing of like, sometimes you just tell the saint, like, this could be you. But no, you're upside down. Mm -hmm. Why are you upside down? Because it's not done yet. <laughs> It's like you're buried in my yard now. Sorry, Joseph. Yeah, yeah. you're buried in the yard because I gotta sell this house. You'll, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be you'll be back on your shrine in no time once it sells. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we all need a little fire lit under us sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the next ones is your comportment toward the matter in general. What happens when uh, your client is a participant? In, in the magic that you're doing when you're like hey you need to take this bath you need to spread this powder you need to do all this stuff and uh the effort is kind of not put in hmm. 
you know, and it's neither here nor there, but it's like, come on, man, you, you just spent all this money. <laughs> Well, that also happens with following instructions, because sometimes, yeah. I mean, a lot of the people that I worked for were not magicians, but the times that I did work for magicians, they would be like, oh, well, I want to include these other things. And sometimes it's great, like a divination says, yeah, absolutely, go for it, no problem, that's really creative, and I think that works really well. And sometimes it's like, actually, don't, like, do not mm -hmm. touch anything else. Uh, but it's not just magic, it's also, like, physical comportment, right? Like, the joke of, like, oh, no, I did all this job drawing magic for you, but you didn't even fill out a single resume, uh, or hand one in. You just kept it under the candle, you know, but you didn't actually submit <laughs> one. Like, that's maybe a tired trope at this point. Like, the the ones that I'm thinking of is, like, when the persons that you're working with, like, are kind of, like, low-key sabotaging the process. And this mm -hmm. can occur in many different ways, including, like, I'm sweetening this person to you, but you are unpleasant to them. You know, or I'm trying to get this person to be mad at you. Like, I wrote a post, like, a while back on with Kanin Command that was just, like, a miscellany of the charms in the, the Greek magical papyri that are to restrain anger. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a litany of spells that are meant to like restrain someone's anger towards you so that they hold their tongue, they're not upset with you, like they calm down and so on and so forth, right? And like, that's great. Like, I think that I really like those. They're really good for, I, I've used them for, to help friends out in awful situations with bosses and p times when like a superior just kind of like lost their shit at this person for no reason, right? You know, so I wrote this post called the PGM Miscellany of Charms to Restrain Anger and I explain how I tested these out, how I used them on their own, how I use them in conjunction with other workings and stuff. And I can tell you, like, one way in which some of these things will probably, like, it'll be a bumpier road is if you're being constantly antagonistic towards the person whose anger is supposed to be restrained. Um, mm -hmm. Or if you're just being, like, you're supposed to be, like, doing some kind of, like, lover drawing magic, but you're going out and wash the greasy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, the, the ideal person can walk by and be like, ah, uh, I feel like an inexplicable draw, but I also have good self-esteem. So, like, you know, you don't want to make it an uphill battle. So, like, I the one of, like, sabotaging emotionally is a big one because you get people who just kind of feel a bit invincible because they know <clears throat> magic's being done. And then it just gets to the point where you're like, um you are actively antagonizing the person who's being jujued here and now they are irritated and frustrated with you and why on earth would they calm down like why would they behave in the way you want them to behave when you are picking a fight with them so yeah be careful with that for sure mm -hmm. and extrapolate from that onto every other scenario that doesn't even involve emotions right yeah definitely kind of an extreme example breaking a curse on that was placed on someone only to have them go piss off that person get recursed oh my god listen oh, you say that's like you say that that's like an extreme case but like listen <laughs> like, more common yeah, than there's you a think, few right? of those around yeah literally and then it's always like oh my god it's like the world's fault and it's just like well why are you such a hater mm -hmm. <laughs> i think people underestimate just how easy it is to get people to throw whether it, you know, even if they're not practitioners, you'll still get people that just happen to throw stuff without even trying. The evil eye does not take a lot of effort to throw. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it can occur completely irrespectively of someone's interest in magic. You know, there's a reason why you're always scared of like that one woman in your village with the blue eyes who can just do it, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> but it's also something to think about with regards to like too much of a good thing, too much good attention. Too much mm -hmm. excitement, like too much positive reception of your work, right? That's why good cl cleansings are a good thing to do, right? Yeah, definitely. And uh, that's why I think I, I love that you've made protection charms to, for like the Christopher ones for like driving to protect people from this very situation, right? So that mm -hmm. they can have something on the road with, <laughs> because God knows, you know, <laughs> the amount of people that like actively will beef on the road and it doesn't mean spiritually i mean obviously just being a, a bad driver uh, it helps to have protection right it helps to have a situation where you're like okay well i actually there's a lot of things that could go wrong and you don't necessarily know all the things that your spirits protected you from like you have no idea right. amount of times that like you weren't hit by a car because the spirit prevented something and it's best not even necessarily to dwell on it because at that point you just get paranoid and think like there's always danger coming but it is a good thing to at very least acknowledge and show gratitude to your spirits and work alongside them. Don't make their lives harder when they're doing magic for you. So yeah. keep in mind comportment and keep in mind your client's comportment. And if you're the client or if you're the sorcerer, uh, whatever the situation is, try and make things work for the logical best conclusion of the intention of the ritual. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Very well said. So put in your best foot forward 
in every aspect of it, including the parts that are purely what you might refer to as mundane. Like just mm -hmm. putting out like a genuinely solid letter of reference from your supervisor and a good resume and a good cover letter. And no matter how annoying it is that you have to resubmit all of your resume information into the cover letter and into the <laughs> input field on Indeed or whatever it is, right? Like that kind of thing. So it is just, just kind of like, okay, fine, I'll do this. And that's annoying. But at this point, I have copies of all these things printed out, marinating in powders and things like the person as a person actively working to ensure this works for me. And so I will be pleasant and I will be, I will be glamored up when I'm in the interview and I will trust the process. Definitely. Definitely. I think trusting the process is something that people can really struggle with, especially when the point is, you know, nothing happens is a success. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the, the example that you gave with the protection magic, it's like, we're, we're magicians. We like to see stuff happen and we like to see flashy stuff happen at that. Mm, absolutely. But it's, it's the matter of, you know, when, when you're well protected, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, it, that exact faith and trust in your spirits that uh, they can get the job done and are getting the job done because mm -hmm. you know, you're doing all right. Because you've tested it with them, you know, and mm -hmm. if it's a new relationship, then you give them plenty of opportunities to work with you. It's why don't over collect spirits, like work with the ones that you have so that you can just keep uh, like developing opportunities to understand them. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that very understanding of your own spirits and what they are capable of doing and what they're willing to do is, is the last point of, you know, failure that I wanted to address where it's like, you know, if you go to your spirits with a task and you, let's say you have like a particular ancestor who you want to ask you to help you out with a given working, it's like, A, are they capable of doing it? B, are they willing to do it? Mm -hmm. And C, you know, is the thing that you're asking possibly even taboo for that spirit? Like if you have someone who is very deeply invested with you entering into like a romantic relationship that is like long-term and stable, they're probably not going to help you out with like going around hooking up with people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just going to the right spirit for the right job and asking questions of your court in a way that will kind of arrange the best permutation of spirits for the task. Absolutely. Yeah. This also gets into the, is the spirit you hire for the given job going to do it themselves? Or are they going to hire someone who you may not even know who it is to do it for them? The, when I mentioned that earlier, I really want to emphasize again, it's not your business to know that necessarily. It doesn't mean exactly. your spirit doesn't trust you or they're not close to you if they don't tell you this. I genuinely think that it's a good thing when you don't know everything uh, because it allows them to have their own secrets, right? It allows them to have their own ability to kind of pursue these situations without necessarily struggling, right? To mm -hmm. find avenues by which this is private. I mean, they are occult beings, right? right <laughs> and occult right. is hidden. It's like kind of the ultimate protection for that spirit and for you in some ways. You know, it's like if you you don't even want that traceable back to you. So maybe yeah. your spirit is going to something that you intentionally don't know to protect you from possible backlash if the agent that actually did the work is identified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. So the relationship you have with your spirits and the process what are they willing to do? What's taboo for them? What's not taboo for them? And resources to pay everyone off, as we mentioned earlier, and the divination process as well. And just troubleshooting, you know, your divination to actionable steps is always a good thing. You don't have to over divine to the point where you're like, that's like my one warning is like, you know, will it work? Should I do it? What problems might arise? You may never get like the most accurate possible prediction of every minute thing that could go wrong right but that's not that's not something that you necessarily think is uh a good thing to know anyway like you know if i wanted to go on let's say uh, a trip to visit a friend and some things that came up was like well actually maybe a delay on the flight and i was like cool i won't go then like well i mean there's there's delays on almost every flight right mm -hmm. and like at that point like are you genuinely 
missing out on good opportunities because you're so worried about like a particular bad thing. It's still worth to do it, right? And it's just a possibility, right? You can be like, okay, cool. I'm going to chant for this to not happen then. I would like for everything to be on time, but I'll prepare for the, the other way around because that's always kind of be going to be a possible danger, right? You know, if you're traveling and you might get a cold or you might get sick or something like that, you know, like, okay, we'll bring some health protection stuff and be careful, mask up, you know, whatever you need to do, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of personal like safety, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't go. Like major warning flags on divination where you're just like, hey, you will straight up catch COVID here and bring it back and give it to your immune compromised family when you return or not be able to come back at all. Like, okay, that's a good warning, right? Mm -hmm. But rarely will you get something like that. And it's a good thing to just be like, okay, well, you know what? There's a chance this ritual I'm doing may not work exactly the way I want it to. Fine. I'm still going to give it a shot and I'll adjust accordingly what matters is that I get this result and if I can do that and if I can ensure that it happens and if I can ensure that I can troubleshoot and kind of like guide it to that direction then we're good to go it doesn't mean that like well it's not worth trying in the first place it's like same thing mm -hmm. with like really rare applications for like scholarships or for dissertation fellowships for example if you're in grad school or for example if you're doing like competitive job postings right the chance that you're getting it is is slim but that's the point of magic is to take that low chance of it happening and make it into a pretty high chance right and like is it going to be a hundred percent it doesn't matter right what matters is the chances increase so you might as well apply and similarly i think that's one of those things where you really want to like actively propel your magic to be like let only my application shine out let the other ones be blotted to the, the committee for example for selections right like let it only be me let it be in a situation in which like i am perceived of in the best possible light and uh, may I be granted an interview in person so I can show up with like my best sorceress perfumes and oils anointing myself, you know, absolutely crush this particular phase, right? So each phase may require different things to do, right? So just keep uh, keep adjusting and don't give up, right? Why mm -hmm. do the work of your enemies for you by <laughs> immediately giving up when you could just keep prospering? Exactly. Like we should definitely in our magic and sorcery and our relationship with our spirits strive for perfection, but never let perfect be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, to not to invoke the adage, but it, there's something really to be said about, you know, when we're doing these workings, it's like, okay, why be bummed if it happens a week after it was supposed to happen when at the end of the day, it still happened. Mm hmm. I think the first time I came across that actually was Jason Miller and his Chic Sorcery. And like, mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? Fair. Like, <laughs> absolutely. Like, there's such a, I mean, as a person who tends towards perfectionism myself, like, I'm a very ambitious individual who like, likes to learn as much as possible and kind of constantly upgrade my skills. Like, I, I see a thing I can't do and I'm like, okay, how can I teach myself this? Like, how can I become the kind of person that becomes good at this? Like, what happens when you get overwhelmed, right? When you get burnout, when you get the inevitable problems of life stacking up on you. Like, that's, I think, when it's most important to have faith in your spirits if you have a really good relationship with them and you've cultivated that over time. And just be like, well, isn't this what I've been working towards? So that they can also, like, have my back in these situations. And isn't this exactly when I shouldn't just still give up? Like, I should still have self-care mm -hmm. and not push myself to the point of, like, ex exhaustion. But I should feel at least that I can still accomplish it whether I'm in a position of power or whether I'm one of need. But hopefully we want to be doing magic for overall long-term prosperity as opposed to like constant maintenance and like constant like last minute fixes, right? Definitely, yeah. It's like the the bad day is the one that you train for on the good days. You know, mm -hmm. When you actually like get into it. It's like when something's going wrong, that is exactly the point at which you should make the effort to light that candle, put out that glass of water, and just sit with your spirits and be like, okay, what do we do here? Yeah. <laughs> I do like that that's your advice because you said the same thing to me when I was like, I don't want to go to the gym today. <laughs> and 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 you, who's like lifting every day, is just like, but go. And I'm like, you're right, dad. <laughs> <laughs> and then I talked to Salt about it, and I'm like, this is going to the gym. And he's like, oh, I'm literally on my way right now. And I'm like, okay, that's easier then. <laughs> <laughs> and you know i think like the whole point of just doing it regardless and and you know getting inevitably disheartened by certain things uh there's an important analysis to be had in like you know near misses and partial successes i suppose mm. and doing actual like post 
mortem or like analysis and and kind of I, I guess metacognition of like your sorcerer's methods mm-hmm. where it's like you know if something doesn't work to what extent did it not work mm-hmm. um, because rarely in these kind of puzzle pieces where we're manipulating the outcomes of events or the reality around us is it like a binary it happened or it didn't happen mm-hmm. you know there's like some amount of grade that can occur mm-hmm. you know and further if something is in that binary category how close was it to the solution you know like maybe there's one extra thing to throw in there next time mm-hmm. like the, to f- kind of figure out what happened or you know it's always the question of like there's a classic example where it's like you do a money spell for a thousand dollars right mm-hmm. and you get 700 out of nowhere mm-hmm. it's like is that really something to re- worry about like it's a lament and, like oh it didn't work no yeah. <laughs> it's like okay you still did pretty pretty well for yourself you know you can always do another spell you because now you just prove that you can do the juju to get you 700 dollars out of nowhere yeah so do that again, and now you're at 1400 <laughs> Yeah. Or find out, like, how it came to you. Like, what was this mysterious mm-hmm. source, right? Was it, like, are you self-employed, or do you make money on commission? So is it just new clients? Or was it, like, if you have a fixed uh, salary, or if you have, like, a fixed hourly wage, where you know you're not necessarily able to get promoted anytime soon, like, where did it come from, right? And so, like, finding the avenues, speaking from, like, personal experience, working very closely with a number of people when I was doing, like, work for hire, Like, it's very hard to do money juju for someone on a fixed hourly wage, especially Mm -hmm. when, like, the next level by which they can, like, for, for, like, a lack of a better term, like, upgrade their particular, like, wage because, like, they got a promotion is not something that's particularly, like, reasonable for them. Like, sometimes the spirit is just, like, you gotta get, you gotta get this person to leave and apply for a new thing. And so you're not even jujuing the same people, you know, it's a whole different circumstance or like you had, it's like, I've had a divination happen for a very close friend of all of ours that was like, it will take you a year and a half to change this because you're going to have to work three separate positions, not necessarily like for incrementally higher money, but like not necessarily like huge amounts to get the particular things in your resume needed to get the thing that will then really change your life. And now that that time passed and they doubled their salary, you know? So it's one of those situations that I think that like the definition really help, but if you got discouraged by that, or if they did like the ritual, but it didn't work, right? Like they didn't like the, the spirit comes back and it's like, sorry, boss, like didn't happen the way I thought it would. Then it's just like, okay, do you keep trying again with a different approach or do you divine and like, actually like, don't do this. Like it was kind of good that it didn't work out. Go for this other thing. Like you are over committing to just one option because you think that's your only resource or recourse, excuse me, to the question right but like maybe mm-hmm. the spirit was like i half-assed this because you weren't listening to me and it's not what you want anyway i'll do this instead but don't be don't be impatient like you will need to suffer a little bit in the long term for it to get good and that's basically what happened so sometimes a, ble- a failure can be a blessing i always i'm like well it's got to work like i'm not a person who likes to cope where i'm like well it worked actually in secret because of the lessons i learned along the way it's like no i need it to work like you know mm-hmm. i either get that 1000 or i don't for to, to use your example but how it comes about and how much trouble is it worth right like does the 700 that you described come to you from sources that are really annoying to deal with or does it come through better ones in which you're able to actually like move in a better situation in which you're like okay not only is this sustainable but it's also not a hassle. Definitely. That's your good standard of judging how someone's uh, power is over, like, tricky spirits. Like, you know, Boone, for example, we might we might point to Boone as a good example. Because, um, you know, everyone seems to love that particular demon for, like, wealth, money, that kind of thing, for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's uh, I think it's one of the things you can kind of use to assess just how much of a hold that person has over that spirit. Does that spirit respect them, for example, in the way that it brings them money? You know, mm. is it um, is it through insurance? It's getting you money. It probably doesn't respect you that much. <laughs> no, for you real. Know? Like, be careful with, like, what you ask for, right? You know, some spirits are like, yeah, I understand. You want this. I'll get it to you in these ways. And some of them are like, well, your relative died and you have money now. And it's just like, that's not what I wanted. It's just like, no, you wanted money and you went to me, a demon, to get it done. (laughs) So make sure Mm -hmm. you, you know, buy them appropriately, right? And that's really the thing with all this, right? Like, 
yes, there can be failures. Yes, there can be discouraging days. Yes, there can be annoying things that happen when cultivating relationships with your spirits, cultivating mediumship. But the important thing is not to ever give up. Like the single most important thing is just don't stop doing the thing. Because exactly as you mentioned earlier, Svinka, it's like, why do the work of your enemy for you? Like if you want to be doing juju against someone, the thing that protects them is you not doing that juju anymore. So like, just mm -hmm. do the thing. Yeah, legit. Absolutely. So I thought maybe what you can do is give us some examples of, of near misses, partial successes, you know, or case studies in which like things weren't working out and you got it to work in the end. I mean, I certainly have stories from every year that you know, every year the near misses gets lower, you know what I mean? Like, but as you improve, but like, certainly I think that's, it's never zero, right? And so I'm, I'm curious as to like, what were some examples that maybe you can inspire as uh, the sorcerers to listen to us uh, with their own workings? One of kind of the weird case studies that worked out just by word of mouth and by people who are around where I am, I was doing magic for a family just kind of like on retainer doing spell work for them. And in this family, there are these two siblings and a cousin. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'll do job spells for these three people because that's what I was asked to do is get these three jobs. Mm. And I'm like, all right, great. You got it. So start with the cousin. I'm like, okay, this person very easily enchantable. They have a lot of skill. I just need to get them in the door. Do, I think it was like a moving candle working where I was like, okay, I know that these two people are going to be in the same place at the same time. And all I need to do is ensure that they meet. Mm -hmm. And so set it up in such a way that they were drawn to each other. They hit it off. Cousin gets a job. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, perfect. That's step one. Move on to the, the older of the siblings. And I'm like, okay. Same deal as the previous one. Very easily enchantable resume. I just need to do a slight tweak to another person so that they don't get noticed in this process. Because they were in direct competition for the job. So I'm like, okay, cool. Let's ensure this guy gets it. He gets it. Move on to the third brother. I'm like, okay, great. Same enchantable resume as the other two. Mm -hmm. And thus begins a year of this guy applying for hundreds of jobs, getting like no callbacks. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? Like these two other guys flew through. They have the same background, the same ancestors. So I'm like, there's not a block there, which we'll get back to. Right. Um, they do have like the same court, basically, in terms of like mm -hmm. not individual spirits, right? But like in terms of their ancestral bonds, like you could even use the momentum of the earlier successes to boost the last one. Legit, yeah. So I'm like, what is going on? And it turned out that it was the one ancestor of all three of these guys who did not like the youngest sibling. Wow. Who was holding up the whole process. And it was really funny because I had kind of written it off as like, it must be the case. These guys have the same spirits. Mm. Like, what's going on? And so... You know, it's just the this example that stands out to me of like, don't overlook anything, despite how well things have worked previously. Because when I'm doing the spell work for these guys, I'm like, okay, the ancestors are good. Yep. All right. Anyway, moving on. Ancestors are good. Yep. Okay. Anyway, moving on. And I think even in like the initial consultation, I checked it out and like, didn't get any bad omens. And I'm like okay, this is something I'm going to take notes on for the rest of my life and be very careful about. <laughs> that was a few years ago, right? Like, I remember when yeah. this happened, but, like, I don't, I didn't quite remember what the actual reason was. I just remember you saying, like, hey, that guy finally got the job and it's working out great. Yeah, it was literally because the one guy had pissed off the ancestor of the three of them when she was still alive. And she was blocking it. And all it took was the guy be going 
to the grave and being like sorry and then leaving. oh did they like beef in real like in like life when they were yeah uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and this ancestor was one that was like kind of like a major money drawer for the whole clan as it were yeah because this is who was indicated in like the previous readings and stuff like that and had a lot of money in life mm. so i'm like ah okay you know it's just these kind of blockages that can happen in like unexpected places or mm -hmm. rather places that are so obvious for them to be occurring that you accidentally overlook them <laughs> and i i love how you learned from that mm -hmm. to be like okay we're double checking the whole spirits thing don't just assume it's the same because they're related mm -hmm. Legit, your yeah. grandma called you a bitch <laughs> pretty much and i'm like man these these people are like immediate siblings like there's nothing different going on and then i'm like Oh, woe is me. Bobo the fool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's just kind of the experience of, like, make sure that what the client's telling you is actually true. And uh, make sure that everything is um, lubricated with their spirits, as it were. Mm -hmm. I think another funny case study is um, what I lovingly refer to as the luck ran out incident mm -hmm. that being what the spirit said when i asked i was like what the fuck just happened here so i, I was doing a luck working for someone who was a, a gambler and the whole you know candle setup was good there was a um, mojo hand in between three of these candles sitting inside of like a metal container lined with sand that i do all my like candle working in because I do not want my house to burn down. <laughs> and this will become relevant, right? Because I set the whole thing up in front of the shrine, things being consecrated for, you know, luck when gambling to actually, like, steal luck from the other people at the table and siphon it to the player. And I'm like, great. About five minutes later, I'm like, who's burning incense? turn around and the mojo hand is on fire mm -hmm. the can the candles are still upright chilling it's just that the hand is on fire and i'm like what in the hell is going on so i put it out really quick like i douse it and i'm like uh spirit i was doing that working with what the fuck just happened and he goes yeah look ran out because it was the indicator that that was a really not the way to go about doing the luck magic for that client. Their spirits were quite opposed to the um, the aggressive vampirism involved of that talisman. Yeah, because you're doing all your vampire owl witch juju to it, and their spirits are like, uh, I don't think I'm comfortable with this kind of luck generation. So that's another thing <laughs> to learn, right? Is like, yeah. when you're doing work for yourself and other people, it's like, what is going to be the relationship between them? Because like, I'll have spirits that will volunteer to do pretty much anything. They'll mm -hmm. be like, yeah, I'll do it. But then at the same time, they're like, uh... Wait a second, their spirits don't like that. Mm -hmm. They don't like the approach. Yeah, so it's a good thing to check, right? I'm glad there are methods in every divination system to see like if the client isn't being honest with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but also you can always check like, well, will their what will their spirits accept and what will they actively form a barrier towards? Like Legit, the yeah. client may want a job, but their spirits may be like, I don't think you should work in this industry. Now you can tell your spirits, sorry, it's my life. You have every right mm -hmm. to be like, I'm the one that's incarnated. The ancestors, I'm the one that's living right now. You don't get offerings without me. So you have to support my decisions, even if you don't necessarily vouch for them. And sometimes you're like, well, why don't you look like this? And if it's a reason that you can absolutely just be like, sorry, I'm still going through with it, go through with it. But if there is like a, a, a pearl of wisdom in it, maybe just consider it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And you can, you can for sure, you know, always negotiate with spirits. After the, why do you think this? You can argue with them. You don't have to take what they say, you know, just as gospel truth. And be like, okay, you may think that way. I disagree. Some definite funny examples, you know. One of the other case studies that I wanted to bring up is um, when to say something is done. Mm. It's kind of a funny one. Because, you know, as, as someone who makes talismans and vessels for spirits for clients like on commission deciding what a time frame in that these things can be made in advance um is probably a good idea 
I learned this early on when uh, starting to do this for people is uh, I made a series of pretty hefty vampiric spirits like enshrined in these like wooden vessels, right? Mm-hmm. Post on this finally forthcoming. I'm writing it. <laughs> yeah, no, they're so good. This is the one where like they started bleeding, like like physical blood was manifesting from mm-hmm. like no discernible source. It was so good. This, that was a fun one. You caught that the... shit on camera on Snapchat. I'm sorry. I, mean, I have to. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I have to gas you up for this because it was so cool. Mm-hmm. As one of my favorite manifestations for just like how horror movie it was. Mm. I was like, oh, cool. That's possible. Anyway, <laughs> it's it's very funny because it's like when you're in that ritual brain in the moment, it's like you're just like, okay, that's happening. Anyway, keep I'm gonna keep grinding these herbs and like muttering the incantations and yeah, trancing yeah, yeah. out, you know. But then after the fact, I'm like, holy shit, there's blood everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like they're actually just pouring, and like I still have a picture of it saved to my phone that I look mm-hmm. at every now and then, and I'm like, nice, <laughs> nice. Oh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the um. It was kind of funny because when when I was making them, I was like, okay, I'll make a batch of six, and then one of them ate another one of them. So they were having like, okay, a batch of five. <laughs> a vampire's gonna vampire. Yeah, right. And they they sold out to a group of like people who I actually trust to be able to keep these spirits well, who already have you know alignments with those kind of vampiric spirits of their own who can put them back into line should they be a little rowdy and misbehave. And then they took a year to make because they wouldn't agree to be done in like the month that I had initially planned. (laughs) And it was just like constantly these, these spirits bringing me more like hard to get materia that was kind of on the wish list for the talismans. And they'll be like, Oh, wait a week and we'll get you this. And then it would show up and I'll be like, okay, spend another week crafting it into the talisman. It's like, okay, wait another week and you'll get this rare thing. And then they just would not agree to be done. And I only release them once the spirits are like, okay, we're good. Mm-hmm. Just as like a point of actually brokering the agreement between the person and that spirit because I don't want to give them something, A, that's not finished, and B, that doesn't work. And C, most importantly of all, that might explode in their face. Mm. Um, so it's just kind of the whole process of negotiating with the spirits to be in a point where like they'll actually agree to be done (laughs) going back to the point of not knowing a hundred percent of what they had planned is them keeping certain things secret as part of their own mysteries until the previous work was done because the final ingredient i was like i'm never going to be able to get this and then literally the next day i had it in my hands so yeah it's like yeah Absolutely. Uh, I think that reminds me of one of my own stories that is Mm -hmm. a friend needed to move out and not just move out of where they were living, but they needed like a job and they needed an apartment. So like all the things, right, that you need to like move from one state to another ASAP, Mm -hmm. like literally as soon as possible to escape a pretty dire situation that they were trapped in. Uh, not the first time I've done pro bono work at all for somebody who was stuck in an abusive situation. Like there was a number of people, especially like this often happens where like I've taken on work. I don't do this anymore unless like I really know you. But like there was times when like I've been in situations where somebody was, let's say, trapped in a really bad situation and they needed to go. Right. So I would like pull out all the stops for them. And mm-hmm. like it's one of those situations where I was like, OK, this makes sense let's do some work together and it wasn't just me so this is a collective magic example where like it was me it was a few good friends it was like people who i really really trust and who i know and respect their sorcery like i know they make things work i know it's not just like a, oh i'll believe that you have superpowers if you believe i have superpowers and i'll believe that you have imaginary friends if you trust that i'm telling the truth about my imaginary friends like we've actively verified and tested these things around each other because we all care about results so we're not ashamed to like prove that what we're talking about is something verifiable Mm -hmm. and nothing was working like we threw like i threw pretty hard for this nothing was working like i i think that after some time passed i was like i actually am this is something fishy like at this point there's so much is thrown and it divination did reveal that it was not a case of like a car crash happening you know where like all mm-hmm. the rituals were piling up and spirits were getting confused and there was like too much work being done because sometimes you get a divination it's like okay stop like you've done enough 
even if you haven't gotten the result you want yet, just be patient. Like there's not much more you can do. And if you push it ever so slightly beyond the threshold, it will not work out for you. So I was like, okay, it's not that. What the hell is happening? So I did a divination that said like, to borrow a term from various different African diasporic uh, traditions, their roads were blocked. Like they were in such a bad emotional place and they were so despirited and declawed from what was happening to them that their roads were like closed because they were essentially, the magic wasn't reaching them, even though I knew this person really well, because they were surrounded by the miasma and road blocking interference of the person that was harming them at the time. Like their agency was cut, right? Because they were mm -hmm. not able to liberate themselves from this. So I did one, just, just one equivalent of like a road buster, like our blockbuster, excuse me, like a road opener. You know what I mean? Like something that is just yeah. like, okay, I'm going to baptize these candles as these problems. So here's one for this. Here's four other ones for these other circumstances. And I'm going to put these spirits over each of the candles. And I'm going to anoint them with these things. I'm going to burn them in this way. The candle burned so quickly. Like the main one, like the big pillar, burned immediately with a little chime one. It's like barely burned at all. Like, you know, I mean? like the main one fell apart like the tower. It looked like the tower tarot card. And it became like a lava fountain that just spilled out way past the plate. It went all over the floor into a cool sun and everything like that. It like I was doing like divination just to like check the wax to see where it was flowing. And it was saying it was really, really good. Within a week, that person had moved out. They had a job. They had an apartment that was really, really cheap too. Like it was way, way under the average market price. And it was good. They had like a, a an intermediary stage where they were like basically like a, like a, like a hotel while they were waiting for the apartment to free up, but they already signed the lease and they were in. And then it was good. One week. Like that person had moved. And it was the divination even warned, you won't like the job, but you need it. Like you need it to get out of the circumstance. You won't love it, but it will give you some work experience where you can switch from that on. And it worked out mm -hmm. perfectly. And so like also a case where I save pictures of it very lovingly on my phone because <laughs> I was like, okay, great. Like this is a reminder to me that sometimes it's not that it's not working necessarily what's happening is that it's not reaching the person. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it the reason it manifested in a week wasn't necessarily because of like my individual, like, you know, ritual that I did for this person initially. It was everyone's hitting at the same time and just like boosting it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, like an army of people with some months worth of work all coalescing into one beautiful hole just mm -hmm. because it's like, okay, now it can. <laughs> one of my favorites. <laughs> And uh, with those case studies, I think that brings us to about our conclusion today, uh, which is ABC. Always <laughs> be conjuring. Always, Always be key cast casting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Oh, my God. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. You remember when we were talking about like, oh, what if um, like Megan the Stallion is a toad witch because she's Megan the toad witch. <laughs> jading yes. and drawing the stallions mm -hmm. yeah like there's a I, one of our episodes one of our kasha records was uh god's favorite and i still think about how relevant that is to all of our pursuits with regards to the ever perennial wisdom of megan the stallion really saying you know i'm not saying i do voodoo I, but i got the magic anytime they go against me shit gonna end up tragic because you want to be goaded with the sauce <laughs> You, <laughs> you want to be, yeah. you want to be absolutely covered in protection, as we talked about, right, in episode thirteen. But you also want to be genuinely in line with your spirits. So having the trust in that back and forth is essential, and that's something that I'm glad you felt comfortable showing some of those like actual tried and true like one experiences you've had. Because some people are like, no, I'm never going to talk about when something didn't work. But like, I trust and respect somebody way more where they're like, here's a situation in which like I threw something and it wasn't working and I actually figured it out why. And that's way more impressive to me than someone who mm -hmm. pretends that like it always works, right? Because like you actually learn something from that. And I hope that benefits people who are tailoring their magic to ever more uh, immediate results here, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you know, just like anything else, magic is a skill. And as you said at the outset, you know, the master is the one who has failed more times than you have tried. Mm -hmm. So always be casting. Always be, always casting. be casting. Always be conjuring. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on a t-shirt someday. Oh, we might. <laughs> oh, we might. That's true. Very true. First, first anniversary is coming up. Might Cut be plans. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I probably should get on that. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. What What are your Akashic Records this time, Key? My Akashic Records this time around have less to do with the subject matter of today's episode and are just the fantastic albums that we were all blasting while writing today's script, which is Heartbreak Wonderland from World's End Girlfriend. Ooh, um, I actually just got into that album because of you, the um, mm -hmm. 100 Years of Choke. Yeah, 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 100 Years and uh, Bless Yourself Bleed are mm -hmm. two amazing songs off, off of that. Listen to it start to finish. It is a complete masterpiece. I fuck with it. Mm -hmm. um, very similar as well to a album that we both like, which is uh, Soon It Will Be Cold Enough from Emancipator. Yes, absolutely. Mine is uh, Feathers of the Wings of the Angel Gabriel by yes. the group Kiss the Anus of a Black Cat. One I've been waiting to drop on the podcast for a while. It's uh, <laughs> it's one of those things where like when I'm like, hey, Siri, play Kiss the Anus of a Black Cat. Uh, everyone looks at me like I'm a psychopath. Um, <laughs> but they're a great group. And Feathers of the Wings of the Angel Gabriel is just a wonderful song that I was listening to while workshopping some of the stuff with you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Remember, right. guys, we do have a Spotify playlist uh, link available on our blog with cunningcommand.com. You'll be able to see it in the podcast page at the very bottom where you can listen along to all the show tunes that we've recommended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully you can uh, listen along with us as we um, troubleshoot the ever-present and ongoing uh, spell work. Mm-hmm. And uh, today's license to depart, I, I picked out this particular prayer, which is to comfort the outward and the inner senses from the Notoria. Ah, uh, Ars Notoria. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically because it prays to God to give you a teachable heart and tongue. Oh, Chef's so kiss. good. Chef's kiss. Literally, Salt and I were just talking about this like earlier this morning, about like what it means to not necessarily worry about like can i get this result it's like what do i have to do to become the kind of person that gets this result like oh i want to speak this language fluently who do i have to become to be the kind of person that speaks it fluently in like four to five years right well mm -hmm. someone who practices every day do i have that skill do i have the discipline right now no i better cultivate it you know like thinking about it incrementally i think is a lot of the ways that my spirits have expressed to me to think about how they do magic for me and with me mm -hmm. Yeah, it's perfect. It's like the ultimate thing to petition for. Do magic to do magic better. Yes, yes. The necromancy to make you a better necromancer. To mm -hmm. quote Dr. Al Cummins from our discussions of the excellent book. And with that, we we send you off into the world, hopefully a more teachable carcist. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, give it to us. Oh, holy God, merciful and omnipotent Father, Giver of all things, strengthen me by thy power and help me by thy presence, as thou wert merciful to Adam and suddenly gavest him the knowledge of all arts through thy great mercy. Grant unto me the power to obtain the same knowledge and by the same mercy. Be present with me, O Lord, and instruct me. O most merciful Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, breathe thy Holy Spirit into me, proceeding from thee, and the Father, strengthen my work this day, and teach me that I may walk in the knowledge and glorify the abundance of thy grace. Let the flames of thy Holy Spirit rejoice the city of my heart by breathing into me thy divine scriptures. Replenish my heart with all eloquence and vivify me with thy holy visitation. Blot out of me the spots of all vices. I beseech thee, O Lord God incomprehensible. Let thy grace always rest upon me and be increased in me. Heal my soul by thy inestimable goodness and comfort my heart all my life. That what I hear I may understand and what I understand I may keep and retain in my memory. Give me a teachable heart and tongue through thy inexhaustible grace and goodness and the grace of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.
grandma called you a bitch.